uh, and thank you everybody um, for joining today's uh, forum. It's really great to hear all of the speakers talk and, and to be able to have the opportunity to present to you today. Um, I'm just gonna share screen and do the boring stuff. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about today is a little bit about global payment orchestration for impact and how traditional currencies uh, embracing crypto can create a seamless experience for financial institutions, businesses, and ultimately in customers, so the families and the communities. Uh, before I go into that, though, I just wanted to probably share a little bit of information about my background and history, to, because it is a big leap uh, going from the biosphere topic into um, the financial stuff. And, you know, I, I kind of asked myself the question, you know, why fintech at, a, at an early part of this journey uh, in my life? And, you know, you really have to find your why. You know, banking is kind of like a dirty word in the minds of many people. Uh, nobody likes interest um, and they kind of uh, see banks as the enemy uh, in, a, in, a, in a lot of ways. Um, so, you know, I spent a lot of time traveling uh, the Asian region and, and really getting to know um, how things work on a ground level in these communities. And, you know, really, you know, rural banking and microfinance is uh, a lifeline for families and communities in these, you know, remote, uh, you know, rem remote rural areas, and it was through that I found my why, you know, how I can make change with, you know, high technology in these emerging markets and change the lives of people, and that's through enabling financial institutions and payment service providers and EMIs with the right technology to engage customers to help them grow. So to be able to deliver financial products and services like microfinance, um, to be able to pay for everyday bills like medical or their children's education and things like that. So that's how I get my why out of banking um, and make it more meaningful for myself personally. Um, although I've had an interesting life, uh, past life before that, you know, working on some pretty cool impact projects at a young age uh, in Latin America, trying to revolutionize the way agriculture addresses uh, pesticides and bringing techno organic technology to uh, Latin America and other parts of the world. That was a pretty hectic time, nearly 20, 30 years ago, and a lot's changed since then. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, shift in the Latin American region now moving toward organic, which is so exciting um, to see that change finally take place. So, some of the things that we're doing here, uh, not just here in the Philippines, but globally um, as a, a fintech company, is enabling banks to transform. Uh, for financial inclusion. And this is one particular bank that I'm very fond of, Cantaland Bank. Uh, these guys are incredible. Um, they're one of many rural banks in this region that service the 7,000 islands and hundreds of communities. Uh, they were established back in the 1980s in Surigal del Sur, Mindanao, uh, which is a very remote part of the Philippines uh, with over, over 46 branches um, and 100 underbanked communities. Now look at some incredible challenges that they have to overcome out there. You know, how do, how do people get paid? How do people, you know, pay for services? How do they, you know, buy stock and goods? And, and, and these challenges are, you know, really being hit head on by rural banks and, and microfinance and bringing technology to be able to enable and solve these problems. So we really need to understand, I think, some of the cool things that they're doing with the underbank. And uh, we also need to understand the gap. Um, you know, right now we've got 71% of these Filipinos that just don't have a bank account. In most cases, they don't even have ID. Uh, and this is a really big problem. And this ties into the whole payment orchest uh, orchestration ecosystem and that capability to bank the unbanked. And, and, and it sounds almost like, you know, bringing them into a, a certain uniform way. But more importantly, banking the unbanked is much more than banking. It's helping these people save it's helping these people grow and, and have access to services. Maybe they're a trike, a uh, single operator trike uh, rider, you know, and, and they need new ties, but they don't have the money for that. So they can get microfinance through their local bank for this. And we, we don't realize the importance of, um, you know, a new set of ties for a small micro business operator like that uh, until they can't operate and their family can't earn money for food. And so they do play a vital role. They, they, they're incredible people, these, these rural bankers. And, um, you know, they're typically the first line of support when there's, um, you know, a natural disaster. They're the ones that are there providing the clean drinking water. They're the ones that are there providing blankets and parcels of food. 
And so they really do provide a very strong pillar to support uh, these remote communities and are pivotal in the transformation and uplifting those communities to lead a better quality life. So where do we go next and where are we now? And this is, you know, kind of interesting because what does the future hold? You know, the world's so VUCA, we, we really don't know what's ahead of us, um, but we can uh, make some incredible uh, changes and put some plans in place for the foreseeable future. So the BSP or the Central Bank of the Philippines has ha a mandate in place to get to 50% of total retail transaction volume uh, into digital by 2023. And this is a staggering number considering that only 14% uh, of the economy was, uh, has been digitalized uh, in the last 10 years. So, you know, it's a big job. Um, and to get to 70% of Filipino adult, uh, adults financially included is an even bigger mandate and very, very challenging. When we look at all the gaps in the industry, uh, how do we do that? You know, how do we reach, you know, 70 million people and, and, and bring them into an ecosystem that can provide them with, you know, financial products and services to help them grow and be sustainable? Um, so there's a lot of challenges to overcome. And we're at the front line working um, with many, many other fintech players and financial institutions and uh, different associations to try and solve these problems and challenges. So part of the drivers, you know, behind this for Tantalan Bank in particular is that they, they want to they ma maintain their level of relevance to customers. Um, why? Well, you know, this is what they do. They're pivotal in the community. They provide so much support, but you know, with fintechs emerging, transactions going digital, how does a rural bank maintain its relevance and be a part of that ecosystem and literally uh, compete head on with the bigger institutions? So this is something that's very, very important to them. Uh, and we provide them with the tools and equipment to be able to do that, to remain relevant, not only to their customers, but in an industry that's ever changing. Uh, efficient. They do need to be efficient. You know, small institutions cannot handle long development cycles. They don't have the budgets, the human resources, uh, you know, or the education on the ground level to be able to support these types of initiatives. So how can we become more efficient? And, you know, Gini Esther, our company's designed some pretty cool out of the box technology that provides an all-in-one capability that helps these banks reach, um, you know, their goals of becoming more efficient without having to spend large sums of money. So we've kind of bridged the gap when it comes to, you know, accessibility to high-end technology. And now they can compete with these major universal banks. Uh, responsive to customer needs, and this is so critical, you know, I think, you know, when I hear about biodiversity and, and responding to the call to help the planet, you know, first we must rise the people. We must get the people out of that pain and suffering um, at a community level so that their consciousness can elevate into a point where that they can move into another state of awareness and, and really connect to what's around them. Right now, there's so much dis, uh, disparity and, and suffering that, you know, the challenge that the banks have is how can they be responsive to those needs cost effectively so that people can survive? And so there's so many new, um, uh, you know, products and services and, and initiatives on the ground that Cantorland Bank and other rural banks are participating in at a community level, especially with the impact of COVID, you know, really uh, embracing their community, supporting families, uh, providing that person-to-person uh, -person experience, supporting them with, um, you know, finance, but medical and local care. In fact, even underwriting some of that medical for families that don't even have the money to, to, to pay for these medical expenses. So it's, it's really heart moving to see the things that we're doing and now being able to do this with high-end technology. Uh, it sounds crazy, but it's high-end technology in these remote regions is really happening. I know it's, you know, I, I think 10 years ago uh, when I first entered the market here in the Philippines and they said, oh, it's gonna be another 20 to 50 years before this happens here, you know, we're so far behind, but the reality is it's here and now. Um, and so we're now able to provide with this leading edge tech a more cost effective um, product or service to the end customer. So essentially the gas rate is lower, meaning customers don't have to pay those exuberant banking fees that cost uh, just to avail 
a, a typical service. And that's really, really cool because if we can alleviate some of that financial pressure, some of that financial burden, those families can put that money into where it's needed most into looking after their friends, their families, their children, uh, and obviously building a better quality life for themselves. So the reality is there is no escaping evolution into a cashless society. This is, you know, we, we, we talked a little bit about tokenization of impact and um, all these other types of projects. The reality is, um, you know, humanity is evolving, evolving at such a rapid and incredible rate. And COVID has been a catalyst um, to bring about that change even faster. So, you know, we're starting to see this massive spike of people transitioning to internet instead of meeting in person they're meeting online you know who'd have thought that you know this is just such a new world that we live in and uh and it's incredible and it's through drivers like that that really bring us to this point where people are starting to realize that hey well i can just order online or i can pay for these services online in fact i can now participate in local or global trade online without having to leave the safety of my home uh, which is very very important in times of the pandemic so really cool stuff going on there but i wanted to just give you a little bit of a glimpse um, at the i guess the impact that COVID has had in the financial space and 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 really you know what sort of level of disruption we can expect in the future and we can sort of see on this uh, quadrant that you know, leaders in this space, China and the United Kingdom and the USA are really volatile uh, in comparison to, you know, other participants that are like Indonesia, India, Malaysia, and even the Philippines that are very vulnerable. Uh, and why, as much as, you know, we like to realize that there are, you know, major drivers around population growth that don't really align with the, uh, how can we say, the distribution of economic growth. So there's this uneven balance with this rapid population boom and the growth of the economy. It's just not being distributed equally. And this causes all types of problems and challenges all the way down to, um, you know, logistics of getting food and, and supplies to different parts of the country where it's most needed. So all in all, digital payments has hit an incredible jump, 40% in the last two years, up to 6.6 billion. Uh, and this industry is really starting to be driven by innovation in emerging markets. Why? Well, we have, uh, how do we say, a unique experience occurring in these markets that's unlike anything else anywhere in the world. You just wouldn't experience what you experience in the Philippines as you would in the UK. And that's a massive driver for innovation. In fact, this is setting the bar for the future of technology and, and where we're really heading. We're starting to see a massive increase in mobile wallets and P2P, uh, mobile payments and even cryptocurrencies entering into this space and some pretty cool projects that have uh, kicked off that uh, you know poorer communities are actually getting involved in and rather than pay to play it's pay to earn and so they're earning these small passive incomes just by participating in activities online and getting paid in tokens and cryptocurrencies which is really really cool um I guess from that perspective, it gives them an opportunity to access funds that they would never typically have access to. But this type of model can also be applied to um, some of these bigger impact projects, Brett, that you were talking about earlier that I think are really re relevant to that last mile of transaction. You know, if we're, if we're going to be distributing tokens and making that part of the economy and, you know, how do we make it accessible and usable to the last mile for those families that, could be paid in those tokens and, and how can they participate in everyday life with those tokens. So a cashless society breeds a new era for financial transactions. And, you know, there's some important benefits or drivers around that. So obviously a lower crime rate. I've, I'm, you're probably all familiar with this, but in, you know, some of the borough guys here where everything's cash based, um, they have these dirty big armored vehicles going around with lots and lots of cash and they and they go off to the um, branch outpost for distribution at the community center and literally once a month they'll get um have an armed robbery where someone drops up with a shotgun and steals all the money and threatens everybody's lives uh, you can't do that with a digital economy the money's just not there so it's you know it's it's a lot safer from that regard and it's more accountable as well you can really see the distribution of those funds 
where they're going and where they're being used. And that data, that, that, that big data intelligence gives us enough information to be able to analyze uh, you know, different trends within communities so that we can improve our services and improve the helpline uh, into those uh, regional areas. Less money laundering. Um, I don't know if it's going to really lead to less money laundering. I think it's just going to take shape in a different form. Uh, but more importantly, there's visibility and traceability, which does ultimately lead to less money laundering. People are less likely to do criminal activities if their transactions are being traced. And easier foreign transactions. I love this topic. Um, I, I'm all about helping you know, rural communities develop not, not only their local trade, but their international trade as well. I believe that's a big part of the future for the Philippines. If we look back into the 1960s, which were the golden years where they, they were the lion of ASEAN region and um, one of the you know, big trade leaders. And you know, those times have gone, but they're not too far off from returning to that. And I think it's so important to you know, really look at how can we enable these rural communities, educate them and equip them with the tools and resources that they need to work from. Okay. So payment orchestration for impact. This is an interesting topic for me. I'm a bit of a nerd. Um, I'm probably geeking some of you guys out um, with, with the technical payment side of things, but it's so important to have this um, level of technology within the infrastructure of the ecosystem so that we can create that flow, uh, that balance for growth, not only at a, a community level, but at a global level. And obviously as we elevate everybody's financial position and give better quality of life, uh, they can then move into uh, what I would say a high state of awareness where they can start to contribute at, an, at the next level. So for us to understand payments orchestration and its role in emerging markets, we need to consider two main circumstances that dominate this economic being. And that's the endeavor to better the lives of people and the high rate of increasing population, okay? So I'm gonna jump into a snapshot of Indonesia, which went from 87 million people in 1960 to a staggering 276 million by 2021. That's incredible. Okay. And with the rate of economic growth in that area, unfortunately, it's not proportionate. Okay. So this is the challenge. This is the problem to solve. How do we get into that um, distribution of wealth into communities where it's more needed and level that playing field? I want to zero in on the Philippines because I'm based here. I've been here for the last four years uh, working in this market. And from the 1960s at 26 million, they've jumped up to 111 million. Oh, this is incredible and there's nothing stopping at the moment it does it's not slowing down and again the similar challenge to indonesia the philippines has is that this uh progress is not respective in other areas so let's look at the population in terms of finance so according to the microfinance council of philippine uh, islands and micro ngos a total of three million and thirty four uh, active borrowers. That's a very small portion um, of the of the Philippines population. And when we start to you know look at that, we can really get a perspective on how little people in this market across these seven thousand islands have access to financial services, which are extremely necessary for their everyday life. So, what's the strategy for microfinance? Well, I think it, it's really all about creating, uh, you know, an environment where the private sector can provide more credit, uh, other initiatives, whether it's DeFi, decentralized finance and programs via non-government and governments can participate in to really, uh, how can we say, digitalize and, and give access to this market so that it can be widely more adopted and, and obviously more sustainable. How we're doing that in the tech sector and in, in, in the financial services sector is through what we call an open banking API ecosystem. And this is essential, uh, really, obviously, because it connects people in real time to businesses and services worldwide so they can conduct and do commerce and trade. Um, I think the important element to this is ultimately the fact that right now, the cost to do this manually to provide a financial service or to do a trade transaction 
can be ex very extensive. The gas rate just for a farmer to drive into a city to do a transaction, uh, opposed to them being able to do this from their mobile phone or, or a computer or even a local community-based shared computer. Um, what's interesting in, in this API ecosystem um, that's built around PSD2 compliance, which is payment services directive for real-time transactions globally, um, thus preventing banks, I think, to hold individuals' money for long periods of time and gain interest. It's really now becoming more customer oriented about the user, about the people, about their transactions and what they need, which is real-time transactions. So what we're starting to see is a massive shift in this space, largely due to fintech partners uh, and Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies coming in and challenging and disrupting the digital payment space. Thus, you know, regulators are stepping in with all new initiatives on how to you know, construct and handle this transition. And it's a really exciting time. You know, what we've seen is lower transaction fees. Um, what we've seen is more transparency as far as services and the handling of money. We've seen stricter regulations. Uh, we've seen better services around KYC okay, uh, coming into place. And, and this is really important because with all of those things coming in, we create an ecosystem built on trust. And that's the important element and been one of the blockers, in fact, uh, for many people over the last decade to enter into the digital space is trust. And so with that comes improved security, um, especially through the use of blockchain. And I just want to have a little bit of a snapshot here as to how, how does you know, cryptocurrency and payments and international trade tie into farmers in a remote region? Well, there are extensive number of blockchain and impact projects that are driving customers to use crypto for these transactions to do global trade. Why? Because the transaction fees are lower. It's more cost effective. There's accountability and transparency over those particular transactions, which you wouldn't find from a traditional trade process. Um, and you'd be up for very expensive um, shares of your transaction fees and budget uh, for, for the actual sale. So this, this for me is kind of like a really exciting space, you know, to see farmers out in rural communities now selling pineapples and mangoes uh, to Europe using Bitcoin um, as a payment rail. And, and, and I, I guess it's incredible that, you know, they can, they can, you know, not so much modernize in the sense, but take advantage of this. It's, it's, it's there and it's helping them. It's helping them save money. Uh, it's helping them get into a space which normally they wouldn't be able to because they don't have the credentials or the transaction history. So these emerging markets are leapfrogging and setting the pace for new markets worldwide. How are they doing that? Well, I guess it's because it's all around um, their need or the demand to create state-of-the-art payment systems that really aren't necessary in first world countries or already exist. And they have to overcome so many different challenges like how do you how do you provide infrastructure to seven thousand islands for you, you just can't plonk bricks and mortar you know branches or trade centers across seven thousand islands cost is too it's just out of control. So digitalization helps them to leapfrog into uh, and catch up with the rest of the global economy. We're starting to see um, all new types of payment service providers entering the market, uh, reshaping the way customers transact. Uh, whether it's QR code, whether it's using e-wallets, uh, whether it's using cryptocurrency at point of sale. And this is an interesting space. You know, there's been a lot of, I guess, gray cloud or mystique over cryptocurrency and will it enter or will it be, is it trustworthy enough or stable enough to be utilized at point of sale? And the reality is, yes, it is. People are doing it now, even in remote communities. Um, we're seeing people trade using crypto um, for goods and services, which is quite exciting. But to bring that to the rest of that market, we need to have certain enablers in place so that we can ensure that everyone can participate equally and fairly and, and grow together. And to do that, we sort of need to look at some of, I guess, uh, the strategic business customer requirements out of that. So, you know, do they have the right products for deployment? Uh, do they have the right channels for distribution in place? Is the pricing effective and in line with the market? Are the right relationships with industry experts there to support them? 
And then obviously down to the enablers, you know, from HR, risk, operations, capital management, strategy, innovation, and my domain, which is technology. And this is where we start to bring in um, the high-tech enablers like payments orchestration, mobile and online payments, KYC, AML, or anti-money laundering, um, bills payments at the basic need, uh, marketplace finance, and buy now, pay later, which is uh, changing the game rapidly worldwide. So what is payment orchestration? Payment orchestration describes the process essentially of integrating and handling different payment service providers, acquirers, banks into a single unified software layer. So this software ex executes the complete payment processing from validation to routing to settlement. Okay? Often enough, payments orchestration is uh, confused with payment aggregation. I'll explain what the difference is in a minute. So what is payment orchestration, a payment orchestration platform or, or POPs? So a POP is a single technical framework that triggers, directs, validates all transactions between merchants, customers, payment providers, financial institutions into uh, this complete orchestrated, uh, automated platform, essentially covering every step of the payment process from routing through to reconciliation. And when we look at that process, there are some complex processes that you would not think would be part of a single payment. For example, real-time KYC check for validating user data, which is now trending toward using blockchain for customer validation. Real-time AML checks, yeah, for PEP or sanction or watch list. Uh, to What's watch AML, money laundering. Uh, uh, AML, anti-money laundering, okay. So it's a big thing over here. You know, we have a, an AML watch list that's what most countries do, uh, where government officials and, and people of power um, uh, uh, essentially are on that watch list for, you know, large transactions maybe related to money laundering. Um, <clears throat> for example, even Barangay captains. Uh, so a Barangay captain is someone in a small community um, that essentially... Uh, has been appointed by the local government to represent um, that particular area in the barangay and people or families can go to that person for help or any issues. Um, and often enough, they have a, a very influential position, um, but they're also recognized as a PEC, yeah, um, which is a, I forgot what PEC stands for, a person of influence anyway, that can um, perhaps use their position um, for, uh, how do you say, misconduct or, money laundering as an example. Self-interest. Yeah, self-care. <laughs> okay. So what is payments orchestration? And, and, a lot, and this is, a, it's really important to clear this up because, you know, we did talk about the last mile of payments and services, and this plays a, a very important part in the payments orchestration ecosystem. But typically payments aggregation is confused for payments orchestration. And this is where uh, payments aggregation essentially is where you have a number of payment rails or services that connect with a single API or point of sale. So you might see a POS terminal, okay? That gets put into a, a retail store or a merchant store. Customer comes in, they swipe their card, they tap their phone, they make a payment. That's what we call payment aggregation. So you have these multiple wallets, whether it's Apple Pay, Alipay, Stripe, et cetera. Payment orchestration is much more complex. It's a beast. Um, this is probably, you know, I did ask myself this question several times on this journey in the last 10 years. I should have, why didn't I buy that coffee roasting business when I had the opportunity? Why did I choose this very complex industry to be in? And um, I guess it's because I love a challenge. Um, so you can see here where uh, payment aggregation fits into the ecosystem of payment orchestration. It's a very small component of the whole architecture. And right here, what we have is in, in this diagram is uh, what I like to refer to as the heart or brain function of payment orchestration. And that would be our C uh, payment orchestration platform. And this is a very, very powerful capability that has, um, you know, uh, I guess like a heart function that connects to all external systems that pumps the blood through or the information or the data through all of these external systems, much like the heart pumps the blood through your limbs. And then it has this very powerful brain function. Uh, and this is the, the business process um, or logic engine where we can create a 100% automated algorithm 
So this is where we design these very complex rules uh, and processes around transactions right from start to finish. And it's not, it, it's not simple. This is very, very complex stuff. And you can see here that you might have a connection to an external uh, domestic or foreign clearinghouse, which is part of that transaction process. So if you can imagine a single transaction has to flow through this entire ecosystem for it to be completed, and it might have several processes at each step, which is kind of cool. It's kind of interesting. It's a bit, um, how can we say, a bit, bit nerdy for some. And anyway, so I'll carry on. Um, card acquiring, uh, currency cloud. I've just got to step back because my eyesight's fading. Oh, yeah, I can look on the big screen. There we go. Um, and then you've got all types of different rails like Ripple, Net, Lightning, uh, Coinspace, so all of your uh, cryptocurrency or blockchain rails. Um, and, and this is really interesting because what we're starting to see now as a massive trend is, you know, uh, PSP or payment service providers and financial institutions are starting to really embrace the philosophy of, um, you know, cryptocurrency as part of that financial ecosystem and creating enablers uh, to allow those transactions to occur. Uh, within that ecosystem, uh, this is huge because you know as you as you start to build out these impact projects that are built on tokens, um, that you know participants are earning in tokens. You need a middleware layer. You need an application layer that can govern all of that and manage all of that data, not just at a at a at a uh, I guess a transactional level, but at a business level. Um, you know, and and that's really really important. You know, as an enabler, many. Many of the crypto projects and, and, and payment service partners that we're talking to worldwide, you know, they have uh, maybe one or two really great whales or they're running some, you know, lightning on Bitcoin on, light, on the lightning network and, and it's working really well for them, but they don't have that middle layer. So they can't really orchestrate their entire ecosystem. And, that, and that's what's making um, our technology so attractive worldwide um, that we can help them bridge that gap. So connect all the dots. Um, you can see here all of these external systems, whether it's Earthport, uh, Swift, uh, SEPA, and the entire SEPA network. Not, and in each country, SEPA has got a different uh, particular platform. So uh, all of these adapters and connectors, they all need to come together and communicate with each other. And to do that, you need a common language. And that's where the brain function comes in. Mm -hmm. right. So yeah. Shane, I'm just, um, I'm just mindful of time. And we've got a, a really interesting question here from... Uh, from Kana. So she's asking if you're actually raising money um, for this project at the moment. Oh, oh cool question. Um, yeah, we just, um, uh, yeah, we are actually, but we just uh, actually on the 30th of this month, we're closing out our series A. So we've had a really successful round. We oversubscribed. Um, it was a pretty awesome journey. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess, you know, this, part of uh, where we're at right now is, you know, kind of mind blowing. Two years ago when COVID first started, you know, we were so rattled. We were just so uncertain with what the future hold, held. Um, we'd actually uh, had a commitment to wrap up our Series A um, in, uh, what was it, March 2020. And, um, but they pulled out because of the uncertainty of COVID. And so we, we continued to grind it out. We didn't know what was going to happen, um, whether we would survive or not. In fact, COVID accelerated our business 10x. Um, and it's you know, been awesome to be able to, you know, be in the right space at the right time to make change. Um, you know, we're just about to open our office in Jakarta uh, and an office in uh, Florida, uh, which is, you know, kind of really exciting because some of the projects that we're getting involved with um, in, those, in those markets is all about, you know, driving those cross-border payments and bringing in that frictionless experience between traditional currencies and cryptocurrencies. So, uh, just to um, just to wrap up the session with a kind of a general summary of of the work that um, the work that you're doing, uh, the the technology itself enables transactions between two people um, with a high with a high degree of simplicity on some level. So the, the problem that you're trying to fix here or the problem that you've successfully been able to fix is that, you know, 
in Indonesia, for instance, what, what's the problem that, that, um, that this technology is going to fix? A good question. Okay, so right now, one of the big challenges, and I'm, we're talking to several um, institutions in Indonesia at the moment, large financial institutions, um, as well as payment service providers. Um, and they're embarking on some incredible stuff with mobile wallets, um, enabling, you know, uh, digital transactions for their particular communities, um, which is awesome. Um, but they're missing that, again, they're missing that whole uh, middle layer application, which has transaction monitoring, Nostro account management, yeah, so subsidiary accounts, with, um, you know, correspondent banking. So you, when you look at the ecosystem to make a P2P payment, it's not, it's not that simple. It, sure, if it's from your wallet to another wallet within your own system, it's straightforward. But once we start to connect to hundreds of different financial institutions that are on completely different systems, uh, mm. speaking different languages, all of a sudden it becomes very complex. So that's the problem we solve. We orchestrate um, all of those systems on a common language um, and embracing blockchain and crypto as part of that ecosystem. So what you're saying is if I wanted to pay for something with Bitcoin or if I wanted to pay for something from my Danamon account or my Pamata account or from Visa or MasterCard or the National Australia Bank to the merchant in Indonesia, that I would be able to access potentially access any of those accounts for that transaction to occur is that is that right correct correct amazing amazing okay i think that was like a really simple summary of uh, of what you <laughs> of what you're doing is that there's all of these banks out there and people have their money stashed in all kinds of places and they're standing mm -hmm. at the supermarket saying would you like to pay sir and and this technology allows me to pay for something drawing my money from multiple sources. Do I understand that correctly? Spot on, exactly. exactly. Awesome, awesome. That's, that's really exciting, that's really exciting. And it really there's a, before we, we're gonna, we've actually had a speaker drop out, which is really great because that's given us just a little bit more time to have a chat. And thankfully, um, Dr. Mark Cohen is going to, who's with us is going to start just a little bit earlier as well. Uh, so we've just got a little bit of time. We've got seven minutes before uh, before I'm going to hand over to Mark. Um, and so I'm intrigued to, I guess, get your insight or uh, thoughts on this idea of tokenization and how tokenized like a token wallet could potentially play into the technology that you're you're developing. I so love that you raised that question. This is this is my favorite geeky topic. <laughs> Um, look, just, and, and obviously you've got to look at the why, you know, firstly, you know, and the why is for the things that, you know, Gay is doing and all of these other great people, you know, making change in the world. That's the why. Yeah. Mm. To token, token, tokenization is the how. Mm. Okay. So, you know, you, you, you've got people coming up to your, you know, um, facility day that are helping contribute um you know to your community to your ecosystem and it's tokenized right and so these people that come and visit and contribute they can earn in these tokens and i think this is this is kind of just using that as an example um i see that as a powerful enabler um you know and then that token can then be used by those individuals to pay it forward in that community so as they leave your facility they go into the local community they can go buy a bunch of bananas they can you know go stay at a hotel for the night or do whatever they need to do and it becomes part of that you know financial ecosystem in that area you know kind of similar to the way the bristol pound occurred i don't know if you guys know anything about the bristol pound but a cool initiative you know bristol in the uk was um you know suffering you know its entire pop youth population was moving out to the big cities and there was no one left so they they, they created this kind of fiat currency called the bristol pound to help stimulate trade amongst smaller businesses to get them away from the super malls and and it worked you know you could use the bristol pound to go into the hair salon and you know get your car fixed or whatever and it just became a thing and that community flourished from that and and that's the you know it's kind of like the biosphere that at a you know spherical sphere of circles connected to connection right and you know and, and that's how it is with these you know 
I, I think these impact projects and tokenization, they can all be interconnected. Maybe there's this layer of payment capability across all of these tokens, kind of like the atmosphere over the rivers, right? Mm. Um, you can do that with tokenization. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. So what, I, what I'd like to do actually is I've created a, I've created a breakout room uh, which all of you can see where it says uh, a token use case discussion. And, um, and you know, Shane, what, I, what I'd like to do with, with you, sir, um, if you'd like, is we can run through a use case of creating your own token using the unit platform. And then we can walk through some of the functionality that's there. So I think that could be an interesting little exercise to play with. Um, um, but just expand on this, this idea of tokenization, you know, the, the underlying principle is, um, you know, at UNIT, we see a world where, um, where there will be thousands, tens of thousands, possibly millions of different types of tokens. So I can have, I can have a token of the local cafe at the local street corner. I can have their token because I go there regularly as a customer. And so I'm going to take a small interest in their business. Um, I can do so easily and quickly. Uh, and th so the, and then that, as a, having being a stakeholder as a as a user, then I'm naturally incentivized to promote my favorite cafe. I'm not just promoting because I love it. I promote it because um, I have some small part in it. And you know, this is the this is the principle of uh, you know Web 3.0. This idea of the Internet of Value uh, is that all the products and services that we use, we have the opportunity to own some small part of those, and that develops a high degree of loyalty. Um, it, it encourages a high degree of participation um, and, and a high degree of involvement. Uh, so, um, so far the technology hasn't quite existed. Now the technology exists. And what that means is that any individual project can have its own ecosystem that people can trade within using its own native value system as an idea. Shane, did you wanna say something? Yeah, I, I just um, just on that topic, you know, um, some cool cool ways that I've I've seen tokenization being used right now, which is really awesome and having a lot of impact, um, is through the use of data, user data, right? Yeah. So you you've got a so for example, this cafe where you know I've now got tokens in because I'm buying there, but you know maybe I'm gifted these tokens because I'm buying there, but what's actually important is the data, like how many times. Uh, a week, do I have coffee? What sort of coffee am I having? Am I going with somebody else? Am I sharing, um, you know, my tokens in the app with other people so they can participate? And there are big organizations that are willing to pay for that data um, that can contribute. And I think, you know, there's there's one particular project I've seen, um, you know, that's kind of just launched recently. It's it's a weird one. It's called Tune Gaga. I don't know if you've heard of it. And um, I don't know if it's a Ponzi or whatever, but it's got this really cool earn algorithm where people participate, they watch movies and, um, you know, they earn tokens and they're paid out in Bitcoin. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it, look, it, it's kind of an interesting way to look at that um, and a different perspective. But, you know, companies like PayMaya or Gcash are starting to, you know, really leverage user data so they can create better products, better deals, uh, more customer-centric offers that are relevant to that specific user based on their usage. And that in itself earns that customer or that user tokens, rewards that they can then use to convert to cash or to make purchases. So. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you so much, Shane.